Greetings, everyone. My name is Amal Matu, and I'm faculty here at University of Maryland, and welcome to our Crashing Patient Conference. For those of you that are interested in getting CME credit for the lectures that you're going to see, you can get CME credit on EMED Home. Check it out at www.emedhome.com. And for those people that want live lectures, we're going to be right back here in October of 2013. Hope to see you then. All right, so let's switch gears and let's talk about a really challenging topic, and that is the patient who has unresponsive hypotension. In other words, when you just can't get it up. So let's talk about a case that we had. This actually was a little bit over a year ago, roll into the emergency department at the University of Maryland. This was a 47-year-old female that Baltimore City paramedics brought us for altered mental status. They radioed in that she was minimally responsive but her vital signs, as you can see, a little concerning, but not overtly crashing. Blood pressure initially was 104 over 64, a little tachycardic, importantly, a little tachypnic, but otherwise satting okay with an adequate finger stick for being unresponsive. Now, her HPI is a little interesting. This patient had recently resumed IV drug use. She had used heroin, that is the drug of choice in Baltimore. She had relapsed and as a result had become significantly depressed. The family said they had seen her about five hours prior to their arrival, prior to EMS arrival. They just felt uncomfortable because she seemed overly depressed, went back to check on her, found her unresponsive lying on her living room floor. They activated EMS, and the patient was brought to the emergency department. We know she or knew from the family she had a history of hypertension, chronic kidney disease, hep C, and then subsequently depression. They didn't know any of her medications. They didn't know her allergies. From a social standpoint, as we said, she had resumed IV heroin use with occasional alcohol. Now when she got to us, unfortunately her vital signs had started to trend down. So now she had a pressure at best of 80 over 52. Heart rate was still a little high, so it had come down now from 115 to 96. Respirations were 22, but she was satting adequately, was afebrile, and had a reasonable finger stick once again. On physical exam, she was obtunded, minimally responsive, but her airway was patent, no nuchal rigidity, no jolt accentuation, no meningismus. She didn't have any jugular venous distension. Lungs were clear bilaterally, cardiovascular, no murmurs. Her abdomen was overall soft. Extremities unremarkable for any asymmetry, and we just really couldn't get a neurologic exam other than pupil and some minimal cranial nerves, reflexes, which were all unremarkable. So when she, after that exam, she got put on a non-rebreather. She got put on the monitor, had a quick 12 bleed EKG. QT interval was fine normal sinus rhythm. IV fluids were given, and because she, we learned that she had resumed using heroin, naloxone was, a, was administered with minimal to no response. Portable chest x-ray, that was clear, no acute disease. Got a head CT, which was also clear. Did a quick bedside ultrasound, which did not show pericardial fusion, did not show any evidence concerning for massive PE, so there's no RV dilatation, no fluid in the belly, no bleeding into the belly, no fluid or air in the chest, and she subsequently had a bedside echocardiogram. Which demonstrated a low ejection fraction. At this point, we're now about mm, 75 to 80 minutes into her ED course. We've done those initial things. She has a low EF with hypotension. She continued to worsen. So she may have been a little attended when she came in. Now she was doing nothing. And her pressure was now starting to go further south. So 80s over 50s, her heart rate was now decreasing. So she had gone from 115 to the 90s, now to the mid-60s in the span of an hour. She became a little bit more tachypnic. So at that point, the providers made a decision. She needed to be intubated. An A-line was placed. A central line was placed. She was started on norepinephrine as for vasopressor support. We got her initial lactate back, and that was four and a half. But despite increasing doses of norepinephrine, her MAP was unacceptably low. So with that, where do we go with this patient? How do we assess, or what, some, what are some pearls we need to think about in the patient who has hypotension and they're simply not responding? 
what I'm going to do over the next 15 to 20 minutes is simply go over a few pearls to think about if you have a patient with dropping blood pressure and they're not responding to your fluid or vasopressors. One of the first questions I'll ask myself in this setting is, is volume adequate? In other words, is my tank full? Have I fully fluidly fluid resuscitated them? Fluids, we love fluids. It's the cornerstone of resuscitation. It augments venous return, augments cardiac output, increases arterial pressure, increases ultimately cardiac output once again, and O tissue oxygen delivery. The question becomes, or the statement for that matter, we're really giving IV fluids to augment cardiac output and augment O2 delivery to the tissues. The problem is that around 50% of critically ill patients don't respond to IV fluids. And in those 50% who don't respond, we make things worse. We increase tissue congestion. So in the lungs, worsening ARDS, prolonged mechanical ventilation. In the kidneys, increased incidence of acute kidney injury. All in patients who are volume overloaded, we know there's a lot of literature to say that it increases morbidity as well as mortality. So rather than fluid status, volume status, we want to become very comfortable with a term that's been used recently in a lot of blogs, podcasts, lectures, and that's volume responsiveness. In other words, what's the likelihood that that patient in front of us is going to augment their cardiac output by at least 15% when we give those that fluid challenge? Really, if we think back to it, it's as simple as this. It's as simple as the Starling curve. We want to determine who is the patient on the ascending portion of their Frank Starling curve. In other words, if we give a fluid challenge, we get a, a rise in cardiac output. The patient who's on the flat portion of their Starling curve, we can continue to give fluids. We're getting very little, if no bang for the buck in improvements or augmentation in cardiac output. And all we're doing in that patient on the flat portion of their Starling curve is actually increasing tissue congestion and potentially making their overall length of stay worse, their morbidity for organ failure worse, and subsequently mortality. So how do we do it? Well, traditionally, we've given a fluid challenge and said, okay, well, what's the response in blood pressure? What's the response in heart rate or urine output? What we want to know is, Let's predict it before we give that fluid. In other words, is there anything we have tool-wise to say, yes, that patient's going to respond to fluids. Their volume or fluid responsive. Got a number of available markers. And as we talked about in the sepsis update, central venous pressure has been relied upon historically as the go-to for volume assessment. Now, certainly CVP is a reasonable estimate of right atrial pressure, but from there, we make assumptions that that also indicates left ventricular and diastolic volume or left ventricular preload. However, CVP is affected by a whole host of things. Venous tone, right ventricular disease, right ventricular hypertrophy, tricuspid or pulmonary valve disease, arrhythmias, even intrathoracic pressure for those on the vent as well as the reference level of the transducer. There are over 100 studies in the medical literature that suggest or indicate that CVP is enormously erroneous when assessing patients' volume status or volume responsiveness. In fact, the only studies that have ever shown CVP to be useful in volume responsiveness were published in the Journal of Veterinary Internal Medicine and the Journal of the American Veterinary Medical Association. Yes, the only journals that have supported the use of CVP as a marker of volume responsiveness or volume status occur in horses. So where does that leave us? There's been a huge movement over the last several years to the use of dynamic markers, pulse pressure variation, systolic pressure variation, ultrasound assessment of the inferior vena cava, passive leg raising. If we think about pulse pressure variation, this is probably the most well studied and supported by many in critical care is probably the most useful. What is pulse pressure variation? Well, if we look at the graph here, we deliver a positive pressure breath for those who are mechanically intubated or mechanically ventilated. During that positive pressure breath, blood is pushed, a little extra blood is pushed into the left ventricle. That augments left ventricular cardiac output for a beat or two. At the same time, 
the RV afterload is increased and the RV preload is decreased. So there's a slight fall in RV output. As that slight fall in RV output two or three beats later gets over to the LV, there's a temporary decrease in left ventricular output. So you can see here on this tracing, an arterial line tracing, this response is exaggerated in patients who are volume responsive. In other words, there's a much larger swing or fluctuation in that pulse pressure maximum to the pulse pressure minimum. And the literature would support if that difference or that variation is greater than 13%, that identifies a patient who will respond to the fluids that you're about to hang and administer them. Now, the limitations for pulse pressure variation, unfortunately, it's best studied and really only limited at this point in time to mechanically ventilated patients who are sedated in sinus rhythm and ventilated with a tidal volume of about 8 to 10 mLs per kilogram of ideal body weight. What about ultrasound? We've used it a lot. A lot of people have talked about it. A lot of people like it. Now, in the patient who is mechanically ventilated, we use what's called the distensibility index in terms of the variation between the IVC and expiration and inspiration on the mechanical ventilator. And if that difference, that variation, is anywhere from 15 to 18 percent, that identifies somebody who is volume responsive. You can see here in these still ultrasound pictures that you can see how the IVC var varies between inspiration and expiration on a patient who is ventilated. They have a distensibility index greater than 18 percent and are volume responsive. What about passive leg raising, something that's also used to assess volume responsiveness. That essentially, raising the legs up, inducing that transfer of blood back to the central compartment, and that transient augmentation of blood flow returned to the heart actually is sufficient to increase the preload and does predict the response to a 500 cc fluid challenge. You can see here a copy from Dr. Merrick's article in 2011, how to perform passive leg raising. You want them in the semi-recumbent position drop the head, raise the legs, and then assess if that augmentation is sufficient. It has been shown to be useful in spontaneously breathing patients, and you should see that effect after about one minute, so it's very quick. The limitation, however, is that you really have to have a method to follow cardiac output. So if you do the passive leg raising and you have that device to measure cardiac output, whatever it may be, then it's reasonable to use passive leg raising but simply following the trend or change in vital signs isn't very sensitive. So the bigger question though, once again, getting back to the unresponsive hypotension, hypotensive patient, so you wanna ask yourself, have I really filled the tank? I've given some fluids, but is my tank full? Do I need to push more fluids? As we've talked about, CVP is wholly unreliable and shouldn't be used to assess volume responsiveness, and we absolutely should be using dynamic markers whether that's ultrasound, pulse pressure variation, systolic pressure variation, whether that's passive leg raising is up for debate, but we certainly should be using dynamic markers. Another word about the tank. So has, is the tank truly full in this hypotensive patient? Is the tank compromised? So especially in these critically ill patients, I think to myself, could this patient actually have abdominal compartment syndrome? We touched on it a little bit, in the critically Ill obese patient. But remember, it's increasingly recognized, especially not only in the trauma, but medical intensive care unit patient, as well as in the ED patient. These patients are hanging out for hours in our emergency department, and it's likely that many of those have elevations in intra-abdominal pressure. We often don't think about this as a result that diagnosis de is delayed and mortality just shoots up. In terms of the pathophysiology, that increases in intra-abdominal pressure, they compress the IVC, so it impairs venous return. It also compresses the intestinal tract. We already highlighted in the previous lecture its effects on the pulmonary system where it impairs our ability to ventilate these patients, the cardiovascular system where it drops cardiac output and preload, as well as the cerebral system, or CNS, where it can, in fact, jack up and increase intracranial pressure. How does ACS present? Well, you could ha the presentation is certainly just an increase in abdominal girth. Other signs of ACS are a rising creatinine and a falling 
you're an output. For those who are intubated, are you having problems ventilating the patient? So are the tidal volumes going down? Are the plateau pressures going up? If in a CNS or patient with head trauma, is the ICP raising? Or for the purposes of this lecture, is it a patient who has refractory hypotension despite what we think is adequate fluids and perhaps vasopressor management think about ACS? Now, certainly to make that diagnosis, as we've alluded to, we're going to measure a bladder pressure, but some things, or some patients have been diagnosed by CAT scan. We had a case of this about four or five months ago. We had a lady with abdominal pain, and then when they went to scan, the radiologist called back and said, her IVC is compressed. So on the CT of the abdomen, you'll see an increase in the AP diameter and a compression of the IVC, as you see here in this CAT scan of our patient, who ultimately went on to develop and be diagnosed with abdominal compartment syndrome. But really, the bang for the buck, the money is in checking a bladder pressure. And if we get that bladder pressure above 12, that's intra-abdominal hypertension. And if we have a bladder pressure above 20 associated with organ dysfunction, that is consistent or makes the diagnosis of abdominal compartment syndrome. And once again, to reiterate, they need a decompressive laparotomy. So calling the surgeon to get to the bedside and evaluate that patient immediately. So we've talked about fluids. So the patient's not responding to our initial fluid bolus and maybe vasopressors. So we're thinking, is ta the tank really full? Go back and assess for volume responsiveness. Go back and think about, could this be other things? In other words, abdominal compartment syndrome. And before you add on that second vasopressor, think to yourself, is what else is going on that I've missed? Perhaps check a calcium level because hypocalcemia, until you correct that, may result in refractory hypotension. The other thing is that these patients may not even need a second vasopressor. What they may need is actually inotropic support rather than pressor. So when we choose a vasoactive agent, use the ultrasound. What is the overall ejection fraction of the patient? They have refractory hypotension. You put the probe on and the heart's barely moving. They've got a low EF. Well, that patient needs inotropy. So consider adding dobutamine. There are other patient populations where perhaps a phosphodiesterase inhibitor may work, such as those with pulmonary hypertension, and they need RV support, where occasionally milrinone or a phosphodiesterase inhibitor is used. But think to yourself, rather than select that second vasopressor, am I, do I really have a patient actually that needs augmentation of cardiac output and needs an inotropic agent instead? And then finally, in the patient who has refractory or unresponsive hypotension, think about expanding the differential. So let me go back to our case and tell you what actually happened with her. 47-year-old female, altered mental status, brought in, and you can see that over the course of about 90 minutes, she started to decompensate. Her heart rate went down. Her blood pressure continued to decline. We put her on vasopressors. We used ultrasound to look at everything in the patient with undifferentiated shock in addition to her IVC, and the tank was full, we kept giving her fluids. She got norepinephrine and did not respond. And it was at that point that her family was able to locate some, something important in the house. They brought back a bottle of amlodipine, or a calcium channel blocker, and her, in her depressed state from, recur, from recurrence of abuse of IV heroin, she had taken 90 tablets of amlodipine. She had done this in a suicidal attempt because of her because of her depression. As soon as we had that, we began slamming calcium into her. No response. We used glucagon. No response. She continued to have hypotension and, as you can see, marked bradycardia. So with expanding the differential, two therapies to think about, intralipids as well as high-dose insulin. Now, Dr. Hayes has already given an outstanding talk on intralipids, so I'm going to defer, refer you actually to his lecture. But let me just mention that you can also consider high-dose insulin if you don't have immediate access or your hospital doesn't have access to intralipids. They should, but say you can't get it immediately in the emergency department. High-dose insulin has been used in the setting of refractory beta blocker or, in this case, calcium channel blocker overdose. We don't really know what the mechanism is. We, we think that the myocardium could prefer glucose, but it's really unclear. Now, the dosing of this is going to make everybody nervous because it's not 0.1 units per kilogram consistent with what we would use with DKA. 
It's in fact one unit per kilogram in, in these patients. So we're going to bolus 80, 90, 100 units of insulin, which is going to make a lot of people diaphoretic. In addition, we're going to start an infusion of about 0.5 to 1 units per kilogram per hour. Certainly we're checking finger sticks. We're checking perhaps giving glucose. But the bottom line is you need high-dose insulin in these patients. And in general, you're going to find that they do just fine. As their hemodynamics, excuse me, as their hemodynamics improve, as you titrate down on vasopressors, that's a sign that the toxicity is resolving. Or if they have recurrent episodes of hypoglycemia, those are signs that your treatment is, is efficacious and starting to work in reversing that lethal toxicity. So what happened in this case? Well, we actually had access to intralipids. So two courses, she got two different courses of intralipid therapy after which her blood pressure and heart rate started to improve. We actually got her off vasopressors. We were able to wean her from the ventilator in just a matter of about 24 to 36 hours. She was extubated, stabilized, observed for a little bit longer, and then subsequently transferred to her, our psychiatry floor. So just a few pearls. Once again, when you've got unresponsive hypotension, ask yourself, have I truly filled the tank? Use a dynamic marker to assess volume responsiveness. And in terms of patients who are volume responsive, give more fluids. Think about things outside the chest. Could this actually be the belly that's causing refractory hypotension? Do I have a critically ill patient who I've given so much fluids that I've now precipitated abdominal compartment syndrome? And consider checking a bladder pressure. Does the patient actually need inotropic therapy in addition to vasopressor therapy? Use the ultrasound probe, put it on the heart, and see if there's really low EF. And in those patients, add on an inotrope. And then finally, expanding the differential. The cases that we've had where we just can't control the blood pressure, it can't get the blood pressure up, in many cases has turned out to be tox-related and in many cases of those has been due to either beta blocker overdose or in this case in particular, calcium channel, over, calcium channel blocker overdose. And when you've got one of those two critical overdoses with hemodynamic instability that's not responding, consider intralipids as discussed by Dr. Hayes and also consider high-dose insulin therapy. So with that, I hope I've given you a number of pearls on patients who have unresponsive hypotension. You just can't get them, can't get their blood pressure up with a little bit of fluids and vasopressor. These are some things to consider and think about in your ED management. Thanks again for your attention, and we'll move on to the next topic.